All right, good morning, Sovereign Grace. Come hear the word of the Lord. These are the words of Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples, for great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we do indeed praise you this morning, but it is only by your grace and your mercy that we can. So, Father, as, as humbled children adopted by your love and by your grace, we come before you this morning. God, may our, our words of praise honor you and bless you this morning. God, and may we as, as your church, as your people, be, be edified and brought together in unity in Christ this morning as we worship you. We praise him who sits on the throne today and forevermore. Amen. Let us stand and worship. Very good. At this time, we uh, offer up congregational prayer of confession. You can find it either in your pew Bibles or it will be up on the screen. And um, I believe you have it prepped on the screen. Okay. Um, it might be a little hard with the door open over there. You can look over here. Um, I will read the... Well, up here, I'll read the, the white words, and if the congregation responds in the yellow, we'll respond back and forth and offer up this prayer of confession. In the, in the Pew Bibles, I'm reading the non-bold, and the congregation's responding in the bold. Following the prayer of confession, we'll recite together corporately the Apostles' Creed. Remain standing as we pray and confess our sins, and then follow that by professing our holy faith. Let us pray. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if anyone does sin, we with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Brothers and sisters, be encouraged by God's promises. He does not lie. He promises to cleanse us from our sins if we are sincere in our confession. Let us now profess our faith in the Apostles' Creed. It's also provided up here. It's also in the Pew Bible. Let us profess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> this time, it's a, it's a great pleasure when we see God bring people to himself in saving faith. And that relationship with God is evidenced in the sacraments of baptism and communion. And baptism is, is the entrance sacrament. It's, it's the bath, as it were. If you think of God's grace illustrated in providing for us a bath and a meal. It's a vivid picture when you, when you think of people traveling and the need for hospitality and, and you stop at the inn for a bath and a meal. And as sojourners, as people walking through this earth, God's grace is seen to us in this holy bath, the waters of baptism. And the table is also prepared for us. The, the meal is an ongoing, we continue to eat, and it conveys to us our saving relationship with God. And signs and symbols, God, throughout the Bible, if you read the Bible, signs and symbols are, are throughout the scriptures, and God loves to communicate himself to us and his saving power through signs and symbols. So this morning, there are two among us who will be entering into the waters of baptism. So I'm going to turn it over at this point. I think they're prepped. There, the light's on. So Pastor Matt's going to come in and introduce to us who's being baptized this morning. Do we have any lawyers, attorneys in the crowd? Where are they? We have a, there we are. The term... Capital offense. Is that a correct legal term? What does it mean? Capital offense. An a Capital offense is something that you can get executed for. We have just watched it. We have just watched a capital offense. I have a book here written by a guy who made it his mission for a number of years to visit people in person, in, uh, p Christians in uh, countries that persecuted him, countries that were very against Christianity. And he wrote a book about some of the stories. And he wanted to be so careful to protect the people that he changed all their names. He even changed his own name. So the author of the book is fictitious, but it's a real person. One of the last stories is this. Samira is one of the strongest, most courageous Christian believers out of Islam that Ruth and I have ever known. Young, single, well-educated, Samira gave her life to Jesus after a series of dreams and visions. Miraculously, she found a Bible, and she had started reading it on her own. She had been discussing her questions and faith, faith issues with a conservative imam. Through that, God-guided pilgrimage, Samira gave her heart to Jesus. When I met Samira, she had already been forced to flee her home country. She was working for the United Nations as a woman's advocate in a refugee camp on the border between two Central Asian countries. She first surprised me by walking into the interview, interview room covered from head to toe in the most conservative, Sharia chic fashion. I was in for an even bigger surprise when she closed the door behind her and immediately began to shed her traditional Muslim garb. She first removed the hijab that covered her head and face, then she removed the dark flowing burqa that enveloped and covered the rest of her. Moments later, she sat down on the other side of the table with, from me, smiling warmly, and looking the part of an attractive, modern, western young woman in a casual outfit, colorful yet modest, blouse over a pair of American blue jeans. She had been wearing this clothing beneath the burqa. Her transformation had been so sudden, so complete, so stunning, that the best way, maybe the only way I can describe it is to say it was like watching a beautiful butterfly emerge from a cocoon. In proficient English, Samira explained that her current job for the United Nations was to represent women who had been raped by the Taliban militia. The leaders of the militia wanted to kill Samira because of her faith in Christ and because of her attempts to hold them accountable in the United Nations Court of Law. She had personally 
led more than 30 women to Christ, baptized them, and was now discipling them. She had done all this in an environment nearly devoid of male believers who might be able to lend her protection. I listened in amazement as she shared the story of her own spiritual pilgrimage. The Lord was obviously using her in a powerful way. By the time she and I met, Samira's superiors were already seeking to extradite her to the United States for her own protection. I begged her to stay among her own people because I couldn't see how God could replace this young woman of faith in such a dark and difficult place. However, the slow grinding, irreversible gears of international diplomacy had already been set in motion. Samira was whisked out of Central Asia and flown immediately to the American Midwest where she began to make a new life. When I arrived home from my trip, I told Ruth all about this remarkable young woman. We arranged to fly her from her new home to Kentucky for a visit. She spent a week in our home. We took Samira to a moderate-sized church in central Kentucky for Sunday morning worship. It just happened that there was a baptism service scheduled for that morning. An entire family, mother, father, and two children were to be baptized. As the baptism progressed, <clears throat> this young lady believer from a Muslim background sitting in the pew between Ruth and me, I noticed Samira beginning to fidget, twisting, turning, and rocking backwards and forwards. It was as if she was having an anxiety attack. In a quiet whisper, I asked her if there's something wrong. She tugged on the sleeve of my jacket. She whispered forcibly in my ear, I cannot believe this. I cannot believe that I have lived long enough to see people being baptized in public. An entire family together. No one is shooting at them. No one is threatening them. No one will go to prison, and no one will be tortured. No one will be killed. They are being openly and freely baptized as a family. I never dreamed that God could do such things. I never believed that I would live to see it. I couldn't help smiling as I turned my eyes back toward the baptismal at the front of the church. A few seconds later, I noticed Samira glancing around the congregation, looking confused and a little troubled. She caught my eye and leaned toward me. Why aren't all the people standing? She wanted to know, what do you mean? Why aren't all these people standing and cheering and clapping to such a miracle from God? I think that I'm going to burst with joy. I think I'm going to shout. I nearly laughed out loud. Go ahead, sister. If you want to shout, I'll shout with you. For a minute, she looked like she might, but she didn't, and neither did I. Ruth and I, however, spent the rest of the service with tears running down our faces as we divided our attention between the family being baptized and the rapturous countenance of our friend Samira, this Muslim background believer from one of the toughest places on the planet who had called us to take notice of the miracle of the moment. Indeed, it is a miracle. Fellow believers around the world in countries of persecution have themselves discovered and reminded me there is no one like Jesus and nothing can match the power of our resurrection faith. Thank you all for clapping and cheering for these baptisms. Thanks for sharing that, Dan. Um, but before we go to uh, announcements, actually, there's a, a couple announcements that would like to make at this time. Um, and, and one, I was going to do it kind of when I was going to preach, but I'm going to have um, Peter DeWinkles visiting with us. It's, it's funny because you were mentioned in last week's sermon, actually. Um, and I didn't know you were going to be here this Sunday. That's not why he's here, by the way, because he was in the sermon last Sunday. But um, I, I had made mention of how God is guiding and leading kind of Peter and obedience to God's call in his life. So that's partly why he's here. And I'll, I, I'll let him kind of share a little bit about why he's here, where he's at in the progress of pursuing um, what the, the path that God has him on and what's kind of ahead. So you want to come up. Hello, um, I'm Peter DeWinkle. I'm here with Miriam, my wife, and our five children. We've been spending the last four years or so in Portland. Uh, we used to live here, attend the church. And, uh, God called us to pursue missions uh, as a pilot mechanic. So we spent the last four years or so training, um, going to school and maintenance training, flying training, and through the culmination of all of that, we're ready to join an organization. So we're here doing our interview and technical evaluation with Mission Aviation Fellowship right here in Naples. So, uh, we are uh, 
uh, glad to be here. God's been wor- working through us and uh, how he's brought us to Portland. And I can see his uh, hand in us coming back here. And uh, I'm right now through the first third or so of the testing. So uh, it's stressful, but I can see that uh, God's been able to prepare me well for the journey ahead. And so if everything goes really well and according to plan we'll be coming back here in a month or so to join MAF as full missionaries thank you it's good so if if you get a chance I I don't know if you're leaving right after church there is cake after church but if, if you haven't got a chance to meet them and they're around just say hi to them get to know them um, also, please know that they're, they're supported partly out of our, our uh, budget, and so when you're giving to the church, you're really giving to just God's kingdom work, and so they're, they're partial recipients of that, and we want to continue to support them as, as God leads them, so um, it's great having that update. So um, The other um, announcement, big announcement, is... There, for some time now, there's been announcements, and in the bulletin, we've announced that um, uh, Gabriel Render has been considered as an elder. So he was installed already as a, an assistant minister, pastor in the church, and has been serving in teaching adult Sunday school. He's also um, been leading youth ministry, which they meet tonight, by the way, right? Um, they meet the first and third Sunday nights of each month, and they're going through the Westminster Shorter Catechism, and uh, he's been leading that. An elder in the church um, is is one who uh, is officially part of the group, the office of elder, as, as the Bible defines it, and, and will be responsible, tasked with, elders are t- tasked with spiritual leadership, um, pastoral care to the flock, praying for caring for, um, administering admonition, correction, instruction, um, exercise of hospitality. Um, so, so Paul kind of lays it out to Timothy, some, some of the qualifications and the requirements for elders. So um, God has kind of put on our heart as elders that uh, he's someone who should, should join us. So after receiving feedback from the church for this time, we've, we met last week as elders in our regularly scheduled elder meeting and um, have voted unanimously to officially receive him as an elder. So he is going to be officially installed um, as of this morning. So if, uh, Gabe, if you come up, I'd like to ask the elders of the church, I know we're short, um, I think one or two this morning because of some things happening, but if the elders of the church would come forward at this time as well. Come on up. We're gonna we're gonna pray. Would you also I, you're gonna do announcements, so the, the mic will just be handed off. To, you'll just stay up here. But can you just um just kind of share a little bit of, uh, again about um, kind of where you're at in God's call on your life educationally and everything else? I know most of the people here know, but yeah. Um... I'm relatively young, by all standards considered, um, but I've been very blessed over the past few years to really um, be able to submit myself to, I guess, God's will for my life. Uh, I went to Bible college straight out of high school. As many of you know, it took me 15 years, but I finally finished last month. Um, So, (laughs) yeah, no big deal, right? Um, God had alternate plans for, for my training, and I found that some of the best training I've received has been in the past few years just being a part of a congregation. Uh, when I came to this church with my family about four years ago, we, uh, maybe I guess it's more than that, but uh, we, we wanted to be part of a congregation where I could just submit and be part of the congregation, serve if, if called to serve. Um, but I really wanted to just learn and grow. And I've been humbled by the leadership in the church and by, honestly, by many of you and all of you for the encouragement. Uh, so God has, has worked a lot in humbling me and, and reducing my pride. My prayer for the past few years is that, that God would make less of me that I make, may make much of him. Um, I pray that oftentimes before I speak and preach. 
and God's been doing that. Through education, uh, I was able to finish my bachelor's. I'll be starting at Reformed Baptist Seminary in August. Uh, we've, we've made announcements about that. We have some pretty cool partnerships that we'll be doing if any of you are interested in, uh, in auditing classes or pursuing a degree through them. Um, so I will be continuing that. That should take me about three or four semesters to finish my, my Master of Theological Study. Uh, and you graciously, he mentioned giving and how we support missions. Uh, you as the church have, have also given. The burden of, of financial responsibility for my education has been lifted from me because of your generosity. Uh, and I greatly, greatly appreciate that. So it's been my joy to serve uh, really every age group in this church, the, the children in Sunday school once a month, to the youth, to the adults. So thank you for your encouragement. My prayer is that, uh, that I will continue to learn from these men being a part of, of the elders and that we as a church will continue to to build unity that we may be about god's mission that we may be equipped and thoroughly prepared to do good works in the name of christ so thank you for joining with us as as the body of christ to do that all right, all right. i'm gonna ask uh dan can you offer a prayer on behalf we're just gonna lay hands on oh did you mute it we're gonna just lay hands on Dear God, we are your people. Gabe is your man. We're here to honor and glorify you, to present him to you as your servant. Care for him, bless him, guide him, purify him. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 You guys, welcome. Yeah, thanks. Hey, Brian. Hey, Brian. Okay, hold that. I can speak through here real quick. Um, I was going to nab Brian. He's on his way back already. But just an update on, on Mexico. Um, it's sounding like you have enough people signed up that the trip is, is a go. If, if they're still interested parties, can they still let you know that they're interested? Or are you already capped out? No. Okay. So, again, there's information, I think, in the bulletin about the upcoming trip to Mexico that uh, is being planned. Maybe it's not in, in this today's bulletin. Let me see. It might have been removed. Um, oh, no, it's, it's, it's still there. Okay. So if you're interested in that trip, again, Brian made an announcement last week or the week before, and it's been in the, running in the bulletin for a few weeks. Um, to get more details on going to Mexico to help build, it's, it's, it's grunt work. It's not, a, it's not a vacation. So although there'll be some nice times there, but if you're interested in that, please talk to Brian, please. And also VBS stuff. I'm, well, I'm kind of stealing announcement thunder. I just want to, as a pastor, hey, VBS is coming up. Be praying for it. Be prayerfully considering how God might want you to serve. It, it's one way of blessing the children in our church and children in our community. It leaves a lasting impression. We want the gospel to fill the hearts and the minds of our kids and for that to be just fixed, plant those seeds in them deep. So VBS is, is one of those ways in which God uses a week full of scripture saturation to, to bring about a lot of kingdom fruit. So, so just as a pastoral admonition, be considering volunteering for that. And I think there might be a few things left for you to announce, so I'll sit down now. All right, all right. Complimentary service, I like this, it's good. Um, yeah, so in light of VBS Church, we, we do have enough volunteers, technically, to run it, kind of bare minimum. Um, so the, the main request that my, my wife gave me this morning for announcements was just please to cover VBS in prayer. And, and, and what I mean by that is, is, is Rick said, this is not only an opportunity to, to minister to the children of our church and to maybe children from other churches or from the community at large, we also have an opportunity to really grow as, as obedient servants. Um, and so as you pray for VBS, don't just pray for the children. Pray for those who are volunteering. Pray for the families that are helping. We had a lot of sickness last year, and people ended up missing out. If that happens this year, it, it, it could be kind of disastrous with the kind of the minimum people we have. So again, if you haven't signed up and you're interested in helping, please do so. If you don't feel particularly gifted in some way, let me remind you that as the church, you are thoroughly equipped to do something. Everyone has something to give, whether you be a hand or a mouth or an ear or merely just the person pouring juice cups. It's okay, we could use the help. Um, and, and it's something that, that I promise you will be a, an experience that, that will change your heart. Um, oftentimes, whether we, when we go on mission trips or when we do ministries like this, 
we go thinking we're going to change people's lives. And every experience I've had with mission work or, or ministry like this is that we're the ones who get changed the most. And that God uses that to grow us as faithful Christians. So know that serving and service, whether it be VBS or grunt work, is a way to be an obedient follower of Christ that grows us in our faith as he matures us and sanctifies us. Um, so please prayerfully consider helping, and moreover, pray for everyone involved in this whole process, that God would really work uh, in this time. So, uh, Church softball, are you, you're going to be out for the next few weeks, so what's the deal with that? Yeah, well, <laughs> You'll let them know, okay. He'll, he'll do another announcement after the announcements, okay. Um, Shiloh Bible Camp. Uh, registration's going on right now. Do, do you still get the early registration price? Does anyone know? Maybe? I don't know. If you're interested in attending or if you have kids attending, there are multiple weeks throughout the summer for different age groups. Those are available. A lot of the kids uh, take part in that. It's a good opportunity for them to go, and that's up in uh, Donnelly, correct? Outside Cascade, I believe. So good opportunity uh, for that as well. Uh, ladies' breakfast will be uh, Saturday, June 9th at 9 a.m. here at the church. Also, today, directly following church, uh, for those that are involved in children's ministry, we have a brief meeting uh, just to dis uh, discuss the new curriculum. So please stay for that if you can. Uh, the Lifeline baby bottles and drive need to be returned on Father's Day. So if you have those at home, please make sure you bring them back by Father's Day. Do we still have more of those available in the floor? Yes. So there's more if you want to take it today and bring it back in a couple weeks, please do. Uh, Father's Day, we will have sandwich lunches after church uh, for, for fathers. Uh, so feel, feel free to take part of that as just a, a thank you uh, to the fathers. Uh, we covered the mission trip. Men's retreat to Atlanta, Idaho. Uh, for a second, I was like, Atlanta? And, oh, okay, that makes sense. All right. Um, August 17th, 18th, and 19th, as well as the 24th through the 26th. Um, does anyone have information on what exactly that retreat entails? <laughs> or just... Okay. Excellent. All right. This can be like a survival camp where we only go with like, you know, the skin on our, in our clothes and we see who comes back alive. Oh, okay. A lodge. Okay. <laughs> well, count me in then. No, I'm just <laughs> All right. Uh, last thing, gas voucher ministry through Love, Inc. Um, we're, we're doing the gas can ministry again. So if you have spare change as well, it's another way that we can support Love, Inc., which is one of our missions and ministries here in the valley that we partner with. Excellent. So I think we've covered plenty. Let's move on to congregational prayer. Uh, so this morning we're going to be praying for Hope Pregnancy Center of Treasure Valley, for our service personnel, uh, including military police, sheriff, paramedics, uh, as well as our teachers here in the valley. Um, we'll be praying for the Toll family, for the True family, and the Vanderwalls, as well as the nation of Australia. Um, so let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that you are at work in your community, God, and that your church is growing by your grace, God, that you are turning the hearts and minds of people to yourself. God, we know this is an act of mercy and an act of grace to a defying and obstinate people who, who desire to reject you. So, Father, thank you for your amazing mercy in our life, that you have called us and that we may have unity as brothers and sisters in Christ, adopted by our glorious God here this morning, and as we depart, as we scatter, God, that we are still united in Christ. So, Father, I pray for the many ministries that are a part of our own church and for those that we support, God, as well as, as the Hope Pregnancy Center here in the Treasure Valley. God, I pray for all the people that work at that institution as well as, as volunteer their time. God, may we as a church and in our individual families be in prayer over these ministries. God, for all that happens, for the, for the people that walk through the doors of that center, God, that you would be at work. God, may we cover these ministries in prayer. May we consider the desperate nature of so many people right in our own neighborhoods, right in our own city, God. May we care for them as compassionate brothers and sisters. God, we pray for our service personnel, for all those who serve our community as well as the nation with regards to protecting us and caring for us and responding to disaster, as well as those who, who invest time in educating 
God, we know that this is a difficult task that requires many sacrifices, and we thank you for their willingness to serve. God, I pray that you would raise up many who would call upon your name within these fields, God, that they may be a, a salt and a light to those around them, that they may not only serve and protect and educate, God, but that they would also be truth bearers of your gospel. And Father, we pray for our families this morning that in our church, God, thank you for calling and bringing people amongst us that we may dwell in unity as, as one confession, as one church. Father, may we edify one another, and I pray for each of these and for the, the young ones amongst them, God, that you would raise them in your word, help them as parents to cover their children in prayer, to speak wor the word into their life every day, that they may uh, just be Bible-saturated in their day-to-day -day lives, God. May they be um, held back from the, the cares of the world, and may they focus on you, God. May you give them peace and hope, and may the young ones, may they, God, turn to you by your grace and follow you all of their days. We pray for the nation of Australia, a large nation, God, with many, many people. Father, I pray for the church there, God, that you will raise them up as a beacon of hope and truth in a modern, fallen world. God, may we as the brothers and sisters in Christ be willing to lift them up, God, to, to support them and to pray for them and to care for them and to know, the God, that your word is necessary not just in the remotest regions of the world, but even in here in our own backyard and in the first world nations of, of the world, God. I pray for the gospel in Australia, that the true gospel will prevail, and that any false gospels or prosperity gospels or anything that deters from your true glory and your true purpose, God, that those teachers would be quieted by your word. God, we pray in great thanks to you, our holy God. May we now give out of joy to support the ministries that you are working at through us. May we be faithful and obedient, children willing to give up all things for your name, for you are worthy. You are worthy of more than we can give. So, Father, may we now give so joyfully, and may we receive from you mercy and peace and hope and joy, and may we receive your word from our pastor this morning with thankfulness and gladness, and may we be convicted by it. May we change as a result of hearing your word this morning. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our King, our Savior, who sits upon the throne, who rules forevermore, and is coming again to turn this world into the true earth that you have intended for us. May we rejoice in him. Amen. And it's Family Sunday, so the children remain in service. Reading from Philippians chapter 1. I'm going to just read verses 27 through 30 this morning. Hear the word of the Lord. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation. And that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Shakespeare's several plays involving King Henry V begin with young Prince Henry as a vain young man who spends his time drinking and carousing. But when Henry's father, the king, dies, Henry changes. Prince Henry realizes his unworthiness and that the crown will be his through no virtue of his own. He confesses to his dying father, you won it, wore it, kept it, gave it to me. 
end quote. Then upon the crown being given to Henry, he vows to live a worthy life. The tide of blood in me hath proudly flowed in vanity till now. Now doth it turn and ebb back to the sea, where it shall mingle with the state of floods, and flow henceforth in formal majesty. From then on, King Henry became one of the worthiest and noblest kings of England. This noble heritage flowed from him with majesty. There is something of this same idea of living up to one's call, one's inheritance, that Paul states in verse 27. There is so much packed in these words, the, the illustration that Paul gives. He says, let your manner of life, and the word there for manner of life, um, has the idea of citizenship be worthy of the gospel. Paul here is stating quite clearly and emphatically that as saved, redeemed people, through no virtue of our own, we have received a calling and a mandate. We must live a life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Of course, King Henry was inspired by his father, and we, as brothers and sisters purchased and redeemed by Christ, should be inspired by our inheritance to live a life worthy of the gospel. Paul gives here, and I'm going to have to redact this message a little bit this morning, but he gives us several illustrations, and at least this morning I want to focus on three illustrations that he gives. And one is of citizenship here in verse 27. One as a soldier. We also see in the words standing firm. He lifts a word in the Greek that has the idea of a soldier who's stationed and not to give or budge one inch from his charge. And then the illustration of an athlete when Paul says striving side by side. The word there, striving, comes from the Greek word in which we get the word athlete. as the idea of strenuous, disciplined work. The appropriation of energies to complete a task. So jam-packed just in verse 27. Paul gives us the illustration of a good citizen, the illustration of a good soldier, and the illustration of a good athlete to inform us as Christians what our duty is. So let's look at this first illustration of being a good citizen. The, the Greek word uh, uh, partly contained within this word is the idea of polis or we, get, we understand the word politics, but polis means of the city or of the people. And Paul's playing off here the citizenship imagery that would be very strong to Roman citizens. They would be very proud of their citizenship. To be a Roman citizen was something to be proud of. Time won't allow this morning to go into all the details of how prized Roman citizenship was, but there are some people who were willing to exchange their servitude in, in a form of slavery in the hopes of becoming a Roman citizen. Because the benefits included in, in citizenship were high and sought after. Becoming a Roman citizen or being a Roman citizen required a certain code of conduct. The entire civic order was informed by one's identity and status as a citizen or a non-citizen. In fact, we're having some of those debates in our own country. Are we not? About what, what are the benefits of citizenship? Or what does it mean merely to be human? And what rights are attached to our humanity? It's 
as opposed to what privileges are attached to our citizenship? And how should this inform our treatment of people within our borders? But Paul here takes something that these Roman Christians would be proud of. Philippi was a colony of Rome. And most commentators think Paul is being a little bit subversive, at the very least illustrative, in discussing how we represent the gospel. One of the earliest, simplest creeds of the Christians was three words. You know what they are? Jesus is Lord. The significance of that declaration that Jesus is Lord was, was subversive to those who believed that Caesar is Lord. Of course, Christians had to do a lot of explaining that they were not repudiating, fully rejecting the civic order. And there's a certain Christian tradition that, that lives in uh, the idea of complete and total rejection of the civic order. But let's be clear, the scriptures make very clear Jesus, in fact, some of his disciples were, were good citizens in Rome and had uh, rank in positions. And in fact, we, we see Paul's letter to Philippi, he Paul is, is thankful because in his imprisonment, who has he gotten to share the gospel with? A bunch of Roman soldiers. And some of them have come to faith in Christ. Faith in Christ does not mean complete and total rejection of one's citizenship. But becoming a Christian means our highest allegiance is to the Lord Jesus Christ. Our highest duty is to the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus or when Paul speaks here of living a life worthy of the gospel, he speaks of our higher calling. Our higher calling. The way we carry our own devotion to Christ. What should be, must be greater than our devotion to the state. Even while it doesn't cancel out our responsibilities to the state. And here... I run the risk of offending a few of you, if you're still awake. Some of us, some of you are more American than you are Christian. That's something we need to repent of. Some of us care more about devotion to the flag than to the cross. That is something we must repent of. Some of us spend way some of us spend a lot of zeal, a lot of capital. A lot of us run the risk of offending others and stating emphatically what it means to be an American and how dare you sin as American against the signs and symbols that have become more sacred in our passions and desires than the sacred symbols of our holy baptism and communion. Some of us are known more by our allegiance to political parties and pundits and politicians than we are to the truth of God's word. The application here this morning is not to turn off completely the pundits and the politicians, Although some of us might do well by fasting for a season from punditry. But we as Christians have a higher calling to live our lives, to conduct ourselves, our manner of life, as Paul says in 27. And a lot, again, a lot of interpreters don't know how to take the, the, this complex Greek word. It speaks of our civic obligations and he, Paul appropriates it as a responsibility of living a life worthy of the gospel to get Christians in Philippi to think about our higher calling, our higher allegiance.
sometimes as Christians, we, we get worked up, right, in our patriotic affections. Our patriotic piety exceeds that of our Christian piety. Someone can say something offensive about our Lord. We're slightly flustered, slightly offended. But if you say something offensive about the signs and symbols of our country or about our favorite politician or fill in the blank, we're willing to declare war on everyone. It's social media, family gatherings. We stake out a position and make it known so passionately. And the question would be this morning, whether we just as, I'll just settle for just as, just as passionately stake out a position about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll, I'll see you one further. I'll take just as. But God's calling is that it has the highest devotion in our lives. Paul challenges his beloved Philippians here with a counter-citizenship, as one commentator says, whose capital and seat of power are not earthly, but heavenly. Whose Lord is not Nero, but Christ. End quote. See, the town of Philippi, they were enjoying personal patronage, and the benefits of the Lord Caesar, but the Philippians were subjects of one who is higher than Caesar. The Lord Jesus Christ, whom the scriptures declare, before whom every knee, including Nero, Caesar, former President Obama, current President Trump, all the kings of this earth will one day bow before the Lord Jesus Christ. So, as brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are admonished in the scriptures to let our manner of life be worthy of the gospel. You represent the Lord Jesus Christ. You are an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your conduct, your speech, your actions, they either communicate the gospel, we either live gospel-centered lives or the gospel is just a part of our life. What has our highest devotion and affections this morning? We must bow the knee before the Lord Jesus Christ this morning and realize when we leave this morning it has ramifications for all of life. Secondly, Second illustration, and, and Paul says here, whether I come to see, see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm. Again, the soldier imagery. Holding ground, not giving an inch. The punishment for a soldier who failed their charge was severe. And Paul is playing off this illustration. We have a higher calling to stand firm in the gospel. So I ask you this morning, what are you standing for? Are you standing? Some of us aren't standing for anything. Some of us are standing for the wrong things. And if, that's, if we fall in either of those two categories, we need to repent this morning and stand for the right thing. That is to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. No sleeping, no slipping. We need to be sober-minded and awake. The Christian life isn't one long R&R. Christian life isn't just some prolonged rest and relaxation. Of course, we have peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul here, and he makes it even clearer in the third illustration, which we'll get to briefly, in the striving, 
But the Christian life is strenuous. Christian life requires our active participation and engagement. In this illustration of a soldier on charge standing, standing, standing firm in one spirit. We represent Christ. We must stand. And thirdly, closing this morning, we, we find a third illustration that Paul uses of the Christian life, of gospel-centered living. He says, striving. Hopefully someone's car isn't being stolen. You're going to check on that? I think someone's going to click it. It's sad. People steal stuff when people are at church. Dear brother Lee Babb, deacon in our church. Oh, well, two are going off now. Uh, is that you? Okay, that's fine. I'm... Okay, that's fine. Come up, please. Please. That'll be less distracting than the alarm carrying on. So please do what you need to do. Another one's going off. All right. Let's set off a chain reaction. Oh, I was saying, Liebab, sadly, I don't know if many of you knew, someone tried to steal stuff from the back of his forerunner and broke out the back glass window and tried to steal stuff and he was parked out here. It's fixed. No one stole anything, right? They just looked and didn't take anything. But, hey, we're, we're talking here about standing for Jesus, being willing to suffer. Yeah. There's, there's some risk involved, perhaps, yes, in parking your car in church. All right, the th- back to this third illustration, closing this striving in solidarity. Is the Christian life at times tough? Yes. Is it a fight? Yes. And Paul does have in mind here this adversarial context of suffering in the midst of warfare. And this is a theme of the Christian life that Paul emphasizes elsewhere in his epistles. And and more on that when I come back in in a few weeks, Lord willing. Um, I'm going to be gone for three weeks. I'm, I'm... being sort of sarcastic and hoping we survive the trip. We're driving to the East Coast and then down to South Carolina and then back. So you can be praying for us and our sanity on that trip. When I come back, I'll resume Philippians and that's what I'm making reference to. We'll We'll get back into the idea of conflict that Paul refers to in verse 30, but we won't engage that too much here this morning other than to affirm that the Christian life is often one of conflict. There are real adversaries There is Satan. There are people. There's the spirit of this world. It's all designed to destroy us. So you are either standing, striving, or you are not standing and not striving. There's no other option in the Christian life. You are either doing the things that God calls us to do, or you're a soldier that's negligent in your charge. You're an athlete who's not actually trying. Or you're striving in the wrong way. Like rebounding a ball instead of putting it back up to win the game, dribbling it out for the clock to run out. If you're following the NBA Finals, you'll know what I'm referring to. (laughs) J.R. Smith thinking that his team had a lead with three seconds left. Instead, it was a tie game. He had a chance, they had a chance to throw up a game-winning shot, and he dribbled the ball away from the basket, running the clock off, thinking he had a lead. Some of us can be full of zeal, and it's appropriated with lack of appropriate information. Zeal without knowledge can be dangerous. Knowledge with the Passive, lazy spirit is also dangerous. So the Christian life is one of appropriating our energies wisely. Activate your energies for the gospel. Striving in solidarity. Notice how Paul says we are striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And so here, as I prayed over the contents of this message for application, my question for you is, are you alone in your striving? And if you are, you need to find someone to strive with. It's 
been said of athletes and many others that people train better when they have the encouragement and support of someone else, right? Teaming up. Sense of accountability and encouragement. Paul has in mind here this striving, this training, side by side with brothers and sisters in the faith. Do you have a friend that sticks closer than a brother? And if you don't, pray for one. Pray to be one. And I say this to the embarrassment of the church, Satan has so many of us striving against one another rather than with each other, side by side. Satan loves friendly fire. Christians picking one another off. Satan hates a unified church willing to do whatever it takes to see the mission through. That's what Paul has in mind here. The striving and solidarity side by side. The theme of unity is also very clear here. Kind of glossed over it briefly in verse 27 earlier. The standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the sake of the gospel. And in closing this morning, and I know it's abbreviated this morning, I want to leave us with the gospel before we come to the table. He says... In verse 28, not to be frightened. Not to be frightened in anything by your opponents. Cassius was a leader in Philippi who committed suicide for fear. In fear of potential ruin and his own demise. And perhaps Paul is playing off of the fear that fills people whose identity is completely tied to one's status in this shaking kingdom of earth. Christians have a swag, or should have a swag, not in our patriotic identity. By the way, Americans, we have the greatest military, the greatest might, the highest GDP. It is easy as an American feel like There is nothing to fear. As we have seen, kingdoms come and go, but the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ stands forever. It is when you know where your true identity is and your true calling, you have a swag. You're unfazed by our opponents. There's a confidence, a peace, a piety to be strong and courageous. In the face of opposition, in the face of obstacles, in the face of difficulty, we keep our head up. Not as a fake posturing, not as overcompensation for real fear within, but as assurance. Not Not a proud arrogance, but a confident peace that God's got this. And there's nothing this world can throw at me. There's nothing Satan himself can throw at me. There's nothing my opponents can throw at me. There's nothing that this world can throw at me that can undermine the work of God in my life. If God is for us, who can be against us? As one Puritan said, One man with God by his side is a majority. It's that sort of swag and confidence. I have God on my side. I will not fear. It is this confidence in God, not ourselves, that is the source of this peace and confidence. If you look to yourselves, take heed lest you fall. But when you look to God you'll be filled with the peace and confidence that we cannot give ourselves. Even if we were to accumulate the strongest army, all the gold of this world, there's no security that we can derive from this world, status and power, that is even close to the peace and security we have in Christ. This is the good news of the gospel, this security, this charge to not be afraid. 
not frightened in anything by our opponents. And Paul goes on to say, this is a clear sign of what? Sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. See, it's this sort of peace, assurance, strength, and confidence that will confound and confuse the world. And it's that confounding that's a sign of their destruction. But this Christian does have a higher calling and a higher allegiance. There is no threat. There is nothing I can do to this person to shake their confidence in God. This was the unanimous testimony of the early church. There was nothing that the opponents, that those who bore the sword, could do to undermine the confidence that these crazy Christians had in their Lord Jesus Christ. That something as real as the sword in their face threatening their life, that there was something more real than that sword in their face that had their allegiance and faith and confidence. This is a sign of destruction to them, but a sign of our salvation. D.A. Carson says, your change in character, your united stand in defense of the gospel, your ability to withstand with meekness and without fear the opposition that you must endure, constitutes a sign. That sign speaks volumes, both to the outside world and the Christian community. It is a sign of judgment against the world that is mounting the opposition. It is a sign of assurance that these believers really are the people of God and will be saved on the last day. We stand in victory. We fight from the victory that Christ has won, and we fight toward the ultimate victory at the consummation. And who does all this? As the elders come forward, also those who are serving in song, if you come forward to prepare the table. Where does this all come from? The end of verse 28. That from God. That from God. What's the that? Well, interpreters, commentators are a bit divided. What is it that comes from God here? Is it the salvation? Verse 28. Your salvation and that from God, that being restrictive to salvation. And brothers and sisters, if it was just that, and by the way, the Bible makes very clear our salvation is from God, that would be good news this morning. There are some who think Paul has in mind something far more broader than just salvation. It's salvation and the not being frightened. Verse 28. That peace. Being strong and courageous. That from God. That and the salvation from God. And there are commentators still who think everything from verse 27 and on is from God. That from God. Paul has already declared in verse 6 of chapter 1 that he is certain of something. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And what is the day of Jesus Christ? It is the day of our vindication. It is the day of ultimate victory. Paul is confident and certain that God who began a good work will bring it to completion. And he reminds the believers after, yes, perhaps offending them. You have a higher calling than your Roman citizenship. It is to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see those soldiers who won't budge an inch in their call or else they would be severely punished? You, as a Christian, stand firm. You see the athletes who train strenuously, preparing themselves for the games? You strive side by side for the sake of the gospel. Don't be afraid. I hear the charge to Joshua, be strong and courageous. I think Paul has that in mind here. He's admonishing us. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. And this is a sign. Our victory is from God. There's nothing that people can do from us. This is a sign of our salvation and that from God. We give glory to God. That is the good news. The victory is from God and it's for God. Amen? We come to the table, and I know it's a few minutes past the noon hour.
the, the elements will be passed. Take and hold until all have been served. We're going to eat together and, and likewise with the cup. And brothers and sisters, this is a cup of victory. We declare in this meal that God is for us. That he has proven it. He has not just whispered it. He came in, incarnation, took on flesh. He suffered and he died. He rules and reigns at the right hand of the Father. And when we take of this meal, we are united with him in his death. We are united with him in victory. This is our meal. This is God's blessing upon us. This is a sign and seal that we are children of God. So take, receive, be encouraged. This meal is only for those who are in the Lord Jesus Christ, who have exercised faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're a child of God, receive this in the peace and assurance that comes from the victory that Jesus won. Amen. We give thanks for the body of Christ which has been broken and distributed and given to us. It represents Christ's victory and crucifixion, the atonement, the mystery of reconciliation occurring through the sufferings of Christ on our behalf. The Bible tells us that by his stripes we are healed. We are thankful for Christ's obedience and suffering, apart from which salvation would have been lost. We boast in Christ, not ourselves. And so we receive this meal as a gift, the merit that pours forth to us as the inheritance which we, like King Henry, lived reckless life, undeserving of the virtue that has been poured out for us. This is our calling. So this meal signifies also our oneness with one another. It's the body of Christ. It comes from one loaf. Therefore represents that we belong to one another in solidarity with one another, that we are standing with one another and striving with one another. So as we take this meal, think about the benefits of the Lord Jesus Christ, and may it be a declaration that we are standing and striving with one another this morning. Let us take and eat. On that night, Jesus said that this cup represents is the covenant, represents the new covenant. It is the covenant ratified through blood. We've, we've talked about signs and symbols. We've seen the waters of baptism this morning. Those who went under signifies union with Christ, being buried in Christ, being risen to new life. The cup represents the covenant, the promise of God. There was a downpour this week. There was a rainbow after. And, and those who are familiar with signs and symbols, kids know what, what does the rainbow represent? Yes. That is the right answer. This cup represents what? What has God promised to us in the covenant? What's that? The remission of sins. It's a big word. Remission. The forgiveness. I'll see you one bigger. Expiation. The removal of sins. The, again, the, the mystery of Christ's blood satisfying, propitiating the wrath of God towards us. It satisfies divine justice and therefore assures us we are no longer under judgment. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in the Lord Jesus Christ. That sentence required the blood of Christ. God is for us. So in this cup, it is an indication of God who is for us. I talked about confidence, no fear, be strong and courageous. The source of that courage, that strength, that peace is what God has done for us. So in this cup, we receive the saving benefits of Christ. We also declare that we have victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have confidence and peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. This cup of victory is our victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us take and drink. Praise the Lord. Let us stand. There is, uh, there is cake following service. 
know it's been a long service. It's warm. Hopefully you grab something to drink, grab some cake. Please fellowship. Uh, the reason we take the time to come here is not just to enter into the worship we've entered into, but also to enter into fellowship with one another. So as your schedule and time allows, please make an effort to stand in the faith and to strive side by side, to form relationships one with another, where we're encouraging one another in the Christian faith. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon you, his beloved saints, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.